Amen. Open to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'll be there in a minute. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Last week was a very powerful moving service as I shared a little bit about Megan Spade, a young girl who at 16 passed away. It, when you see what happened in Megan's life and how we preached on being an overcomer, and then this week I posted that I will not leave this planet till Jesus gives death permission to take me. So you have these conflicts that you're always working with. You know, because some people are taking young and some, but I still want to trust God that my time on this earth is dictated by him. And I will not leave this planet until God says, that's good, you can go now. Therefore, I will continue to do what I do and how I've done it and, and live life to the fullest. Can you get an amen? Now, to each his own, you have to decide what God has for you. I know that there are those that are watching online and they're probably curious about you know, what's going to happen over, I can just tell you this, life is life, you got to live, you got to keep pressing out, you got to keep believing God for the best, amen, then you got to accept the verdict. Uh, so talking about overcomers, overcomers are barrier breakers, when you think of the word barrier, it's something that blocks passage or intend to do so, if you're in business, there's always something that blocks your passage, if you're a believer in Christ, there's always something that's trying to block you from going to the next level, amen, it'll limit you. Uh, the second thing, and it prevents a movement or an action to go somewhere many time many times barriers are put on us by others that's what they said they said you'll never mount anything you'll never be any good you're never going to uh, uh you're never going to get over what you're going through right now you may have been uh, diagnosed with a disability when you were younger and you bought it you took it and you said okay i'll never be any better than what i am right now that's a barrier then you got to decide to you for yourself am i going to break that a breaker according to the hebrew language is to press through burst out abroad to increase acts chapter 3 verse 15 and hebrews chapter 12 2 calls jesus the prince of life the other calls him the author. Another word is the pioneer. I love pioneers. I dress like a pioneer. They're, but they're, pioneers are someone who establishes and finds a, a new frontier, if you would. Amen. As our nation has been founded. So both of these words are the same Greek word, archigos, which we get our word archaeology, in which you would go out and you would begin to discover and find things, which means one who takes the lead or one who goes through before that other may follow. He is the pioneer. He's, he's not just a trailblazer. He's somebody breaking the path, if you would. So Jesus is that for us in our, all our obstacles. He's gone before us. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Look at unto Jesus, the author and finisher, or the ar archaeologist of our faith. He's pressed through, so you look at him, then you can press through. He'll make a way. Can I get an amen? So when I look through Scripture, I mean, I could pick uh, literally, literally 50, 60, 70 different uh, characters who had overcome. But one that just really stands out to me is David. David was a young man who overcame so many barriers. First barrier in it was his family. How many know that a family can be a barrier? Amen. What you was born into. That's why I'm not one of these green leaf chasers. I, I can't chase where my family came from. I'm not against you doing it. I hear people all the time telling me, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually kin to queen this and king that. I, I say, you know what? I'm kin to this dude that had this giant boat and, 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 and floated around for a year. It was in a 40-day rainstorm. I'm kin to him somehow, some way. And so if you connected to him, we're probably kin. So the first barrier was his family. When his father, Jesse, was asked to gather all his sons so that Samuel the prophet could select the next king of Israel, David wasn't even invited to attend. It's tough whenever there's an invitation and the preacher's coming or the prophet's coming, and you don't even get invited. So there's seven brothers that showed up in the house, and the scripture tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm going to be nice, leave you sitting down today. How about that? Amen. But the Lord said to Samuel, I'm going to start verse 7. I'll catch up with you in verse 10. He said, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at all the things people look at. God looks on the heart. He looks on the inside and not just the exterior. Many times we look at somebody's tall in stature or big in stature, we say, that would make a great king. They'd already had that with King Saul. So verse 10 says, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen them. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We'll not sit down until he arrives. So when David comes in, he's a good looking 
looking young man, but he's a young man. And he, when you look at him, you say, well, he's connected to this family. Many times, family can become a barrier. Family, some family will sit back, and I'm, I'm not being mean here, but I'm just telling you, some family will say, you know, I never overcame, so I really don't want you to overcome. Because if you overcome, it may, may, look, may, may make me look bad. Each individual has to decide in life how much you want to overcome and how far you want to go in life. I'm a promoter of my children. I'm a promoter of my staff. Amen. I want to see them get better than what I had. My dad had that same spirit about it. He wanted me to do better than he had. There's something about pressing and pushing somebody else. Don't hold them back. So I get a little upset with Jesse when he had David out in the field. But God said, "Uh uh-uh, it ain't none of them seven boys. I want the littlest one. So here he come, red-headed, red, freckle face, Opie-looking thing, running and up in the house. Amen. If you're too old, you don't know who Opie is. Amen. But they put the oil over him. It released itself, and he became the king of what I call a post-dated anointing. Amen. Overlooked, underappreciated. Many folk can feel that way. Family ought to push you forward and move on. The same was true of his brothers. During the epic battle between Israel and the Philistines, when David spoke out against Goliath's defiance and challenges, his brothers insulted him and told him to go home. Amen. Here he is in this battle of 40 days. He goes out, he brings cheese, he brings wine, he brings bread. Amen. When he gets there, he brings a statement up. Hey, I, I, I think somebody ought to do something. Verse 28 of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel says, When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave your few sheep with in the wilderness? When I hear the word few sheep, I hear the word condens... Uh, uh, what's the word? I wanted to say condensation. Uh, yeah, condescending. Amen. Put him down. Put him down. Just put, where did you leave them few sheep? Amen. And anytime you hear that from somebody, you understand they're struggling with inferiority. So he's got an inferiority about who he is. Look, I'm the oldest brother. Watch this. I should be the next king. I should have been the one anointed. When I saw Samuel coming, amen, in his chariot, I thought to myself, look here, here, God done saw me, but he picked you, you little cheese, wine, uh, carrying, bread hauling, sheep tending, little brother, amen, you ain't even really family. Uh, Your mama and my mama ain't even the same mama. You illegitimate boy, amen, daddy jumped the fence to have you, and here you are, acting the way you act, I I tell you, what are you doing out here? Why why don't you look after your few sheep, and with whom did you leave those sheep with? I know how conceited you are, and how wicked your heart is when you come down here to watch the battle. You talk about a barrier. To hit a bear, to have your own brother speak against you, the one that ought to be leading you, the eldest brother, the example. But you hit this barrier, and David is there, and he's here to defy Goliath. But David had a heart after God. And his heart was telling him, even if my brothers don't understand who God is in my life, And what God means to me, I'm not going to sit back here and listen to your envy. Envy, my friend, is painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another, joined with a desire to possess the same advantage. Let me break it down like this. We are not equal. We will never be equal. You will not be equal to me. I will not be equal to you. Nowhere in the Word of God does God say, I formed all men to be equal. Abraham Lincoln said that. God didn't say that. If all men are equal and all men are brothers, then why are the rich more equal than others? Some people were not born into prosperity. Some people were not born into blessing. Some people were not born with, with a great athletic ability. And I read that and I see that and I, and I watch and see how people are. And we act like, hey, we just need to be equal. We're not going to be equal. We're never going to be equal. Some of you are better looking than others. Don't look around. Some... So, 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 you know, and we do this. We, we compare. Comparison demoralizes. And it puts you down. And so, and so Eliab comes out and he puts David down. He said, you ought to be after your sheep. You ought to be back home. What, what business do you have? And David actually said, is there not a cause that somebody stands up and fights for this? Is there not a reason? In other words, there's a barrier here. I've hit it, but I've got to overcome this. Do you know how he overcame it? He turned his back on his brother. 
He turned around and said, listen, I'm going to talk to somebody that's going to listen to me. And you know the story. He went to King Saul. He gave his resume to him and said to him, look, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. David had never fought a man before that we know of, but he knew that he did that. Proverbs 14, 29 says, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalts folly. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy will rot in the bones. To look at somebody else's advantage all the time. And what I see in our nation right now is a whole lot of envy. People are envying the prosperous. They're envying this and they're envying that. Quit trying to be equal with others. Just take what you got. Thank God for who you are. Amen. And the abilities and the talents and the blessings of God in your life. And don't beat yourself up because you were born in Texas. Or Alabama. Or Louisiana, or a great, the great nation of America. Don't beat yourself up over that. Some people act like, we got to apologize? I'm not apologizing. Amen. I have no apology to make. It was God that put me here, and when he put me here, and amen, it is up to me how I'm going to live my life out. Can I get amen? His next barrier, amen, was his leader. Sometimes an employer, a leader, a, a, a strong family member like an older brother or a father can cause you to stop. His leader was Saul. Saul the king was continually trying to put down David's leadership and effectiveness. When David offered to fight Goliath, it was Saul that told him, you're not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him. When out of jealousy, Saul declared David his enemy and for many years repeatedly tried to kill him. You know, it was what David rescued Saul. David helped Saul overcome. Had David not taken out Goliath, what would have happened? Saul would have lost his kingdom. Matter of fact, he'd have lost his life on that day because he'd have been one out fighting him. And yet he turned on him. Many times we benefit employers. Amen. We benefit other people in our life. And they may turn on you. And, as a, and you see their leadership. And you say, God, help me. I've often told you guys leadership has come to three areas. There's manipulation, intimidation, and inspiration manipulation is always through deceit somebody always trying to deceive you intimidation is always through fear well if you don't do that this is going to happen the threat of firing the threat of losing finances but inspiration is the greatest of all leadership is by example jesus taught us that when he served one another when i serve uh, listen the last thing i wanted to see this week and it's not boasting to me but i'm still able to do it if i can handle a shovel then i'm going to go out and shovel with the guys if i can handle working with the guys i'm going to be out there working with them because the issue my friend is being an example and also i, I honestly i have this little guilt feeling when i see others do Charlie out there working, amen, so I want to be out there working with her. I just don't want to sit back. I'm not an office guy. And many times as a leader in life, you got to help other people overcome. His next barrier overcame was his background. How about your background? When I listen to your stories and I watch some of your testimonies, I started picking up on background. Saul came from a good and a very powerful family. His dad was a mighty Benjamite, a man of power, powerful, uh, amen. He uh, was a landowner, a leader of the tribe. David, on the other hand, came from poor sheep farmers. Look, don't look at your past and ever say, because of my past, I can't be an overcomer. Amen. You can't do that. I've told you oftentimes where I'm from. I, I had an outdoor bathroom, a two-holer. We were richer than other people. We were thinking the other day, we are talking about, um, this is just country stuff. But we had three channels on TV, NBC, ABC, CBS, period. And, and if you wanted the antenna turn, my dad would point at the door, and me and my brother would go and stick our hand outside the door and turn the antenna, amen, until he yelled, whoa. If the channel was to change, we were the channel changers. Amen. We were the remotes. We come up at a great time in life where there was one air conditioner in our whole house. It was in my dad's bedroom. I think to myself how different I am. I'm always trying to make sure my kids are good and they got cool weather and they got nice cars and this, that, and the other. My dad, we couldn't afford it. So my dad always had the AC in there because he was the one that worked. We didn't work. You sat in the hot house. He back there in the back. Amen. The other thing about it is when I look back and I realize how hard my pop worked. How he mowed his own grass and broke down his own tires and he did the things that he did. But you look at your background and you think to yourself, well, you know, Pastor, I came from that kind of life, this, that, and the other. It should not stop you. Matter of fact, it should pole vault you to being a better overcomer. I almost feel sorry for this generation that hasn't overcome the things that you've overcome. Amen. Because once, once we're gone and they're stuck with those obstacles, I'm praying they figure out how to figure this thing out. 
Amen. It's very important. So even your background. His fourth barrier he had was his youthfulness and inexperience. There ain't nothing you can do about inexperience other than have experience. But David had a post-dated anointing as a king. As a teenager, he was told, you're going to be a king. They ain't nothing like somebody writing you a check for a million dollars, but it ain't good for the next 10 years. And you got to hold on to that check. Please, whatever you do, don't mail that check in and get lost in the mail. Come on now, give me an amen. Uh, so, so it's important to hold on to that check because you're going to want to take it to the bank and cash it when, it when the date comes in. Amen, when it's the right date. David had that. It was post-dated. His anointing was going to kick in after Saul was dead. Amen, but he couldn't use it. And David never used it as an opportunity to try to kill Saul. He didn't do it. As an overcomer, he said, you know what? I cannot overcome by killing that man. I will not touch God's anointing. I will not do him any harm. Amen. I'm not going to allow that to happen. At the time of the fight with Goliath, he was considered a youth. But by the time he finished, he was considered a man. David overcame because he refused to allow barriers to impede his future. In order to become an overcomer like David, you've got to use previous experiences as preparation for future battles. Whatever I've gone through, when I've overcome these little obstacles in life, I know it'll help me overcome later on. Face an opposition greater than yourself. Amen. If your ministry or your business is to grow, you as a leader has to grow. We overcome in order to help others overcome. When David defeated Goliath, the whole Israelite army became overcomers. David learned this. When, when Saul began to attack him, the first thing that he did, and you know the story, he tried to pin him to the wall with his spears. He, he tried to set him up to die among the Philistines. And David, just he ran and he refused to talk against him. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do to be an overcomer is quit talking against the authorities in your life. And just turn you back and run from it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to let it destroy me. So the qualities to help others overcome. David not only was, a, was somebody that could lift a lid for somebody. He wasn't somebody just that overcame himself. He helped others. He had a friend named Jonathan. Oh, I pray in life you get a Jonathan. That you have somebody that you can talk to. That you can connect with. It could be a spouse. It could be a friend. It could be somebody you brought up with. But you got somebody. And Jonathan and David had this covenant with one another. Amen. And they constantly were helping each other overcome. So first you overcome with your words. That I can speak good words into your life. I can be an encouragement to you. So David and Saul's son, Jonathan did that. Amen. They were brothers from another mother. Second with your actions. How you live. And you know it was Jonathan that told David, look I'm going to shoot an arrow and when it lands at a certain place, if you see it, my dad is trying to kill you. It was, I guess you'd call it a text message. Amen. He shot an arrow out there. David saw the arrow and he took off running for his life because he knew at that time that Saul was going mad. Amen. And then you got to give up so others can go up. There are times that for somebody to give, to go up, you've got to give up. 1 Samuel 23, 15 says, while David was at Horish in the desert of Zeth, he learned that Saul had came to take his life. Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David and Horus and helped him find strength in God. He said, don't be afraid. My father, Saul, will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father knows this well. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horus. With Jonathan's help, David would never have survived. He had never made it to the throne. It was literally Jonathan that helped make David king. He said, look, I'm going to pick you up. It ought, to be my, it ought to be my crown. I ought to be the next king. But I'm going to lift you up. I believe God has said. And there are times in life you've got to quit being so jealous and envious and look at people that God has an anointing on, has a blessing on. I don't care if it's an employer, an employee, a friend, a family member. But quit. You know, I've often said, if I can't wear the coat of many colors, I want to hang out with the one that does. Amen. I just want to be around favor. All, if I see favor, I just want to be around it. I want to connect to that. David became an overcomer. Now, did, how about your family, your background, your life, uh, your resume? What does that mean in life? That's going to help you when you hit the big things. When obstacles hit, and it becomes very powerful. Amen. And you wonder what's going to happen. The Scripture tells us later on that David, running from Saul, ran into a place called Gath. Do you remember what Gath was? It was Goliath's hometown. 
If I say Tuscumbia, you know that's my hometown. Amen. A guy posted this, uh, a guy I'm not even very familiar with. I saw him post something about Florence, Alabama, Faith Tabernacle, that there was a guy named Lyndall Cooley that led worship or, or sang there. And Lynn was a part of one of the greatest revivals in Pensacola as a worship leader. Well, I just posted, I got born again at that church. I, I, that's where I met Henry Melton and Lenny LeBlanc and Will McFarlane. And, and he said, wow, I didn't know that. I used to preach there too. So all these connections. When you mention your hometown, it means something. So when David ran, he thought, where am I going to hide? Where can I hide that nobody would find me? I know where I can hide. I'm going to go to the enemy's camp. And he went into Gath with Goliath's sword. Woo, that's a brave move right there, my friend. He goes in there and he's feigning madness. He's drooling. He's drooling. You ever just look at somebody and say they're mad? So he's drooling. He's scratching on the gate, and he's marking it. I'll leave that right there. And they said, this man has lost his mind. David, the great prince, is crazy. Let's just let him hang out here. If, if when I read this, I realize what was going on. First Samuel 17, excuse me, 27 through 30 tells us in these four chapters of compromise, David now living with the Philistines for 16 months. Saul the king is now consulting witches. Samuel's disturbed, literally, the Bible says, from his coffin. And in 1 Samuel 27, verse 9, says, Whenever David attacked an area, so he's living among the Philistines, but he would go out to an attack an area, he did not leave a man or a woman alive. But took the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, and the camels, and the clothes, and he returned to Achish. Amen. There at Gath. When Achish uh, asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of, of, of Jamel, or against the Negev of the Kenites. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as for 16 months, my friend, while he lived in the Philistine territory. Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so odious to his people the Israelites, that he will be my servant forever. David had a motto. Nobody lives, nobody talks. And I know it's violent. I know it's uh, something that's hard to wrap your mind around. But David understood the Philistines were enemies of God. And he went out and he began to attack them. And he let no one live. He brought back looting stuff. And they thought all that was coming from the Israelites. Amen. He had been displaced. He was a man. You're talking about feeling like I'm, I'm no longer an overcomer. He's displaced in life. Saul had driven him far from his country. The Philistines had driven him far from their camp. 29 verse 4, 1 Samuel says, But the Philistine commanders were angry with him and said, Send the man back that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle, for he will turn against us during the fighting. How better he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men. That's what's said about him. Then he feigned madness and they allowed him to stay. But he's displaced. He's living among the enemy. Second thing, that barrier that he hit, was he was the disillusionment. While David was raiding, he was also being raided. In other words, when he went out, the Amalekites came in and took over his family and all of his stuff. They plundered Ziglag, the city David was living in. They took his wives. They took his children. They took them prisoner. Amen. They took all of his savings. And now his men are turning against him. You're talking about another barrier. is when people you love start turning against you. Amen. His loyal, mighty men, fatigued, hungry, mostly bankrupt. Their family's gone. They turned. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord. One scripture says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. What helped him do that? I tell you what helped me. I fought a lion, I encouraged myself. I fought a bear, I encouraged myself. I fought a Goliath, I encouraged myself. I went out and dealt with Philistines, I encouraged myself. There are times in life, if you're going to be an overcomer, you got to make up your mind, I am an over. I am a. I am. Amen. I'm not going to sit back. I'm not going to sit back and let this virus take the rest of my life. I'm not going to sit back and let the economy take the rest of my life. I'm not going to sit back and listen to people say we all got to be equal, take the rest of my life. I'm going to live my life and I'm going to be a. I got to be, my friend. So distressed, 1 Samuel 30, verse 4. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left. Weeping releases you. There's something about allowing yourself to cry, sir. That will release you. 
Getting into a place in life where, you know what, I, I feel powerless at this moment. My family has been taken from me. My children, all my substance, everything is gone. And the scripture says that David began to weep. The men began to weep. And then something happened in his life. It's something like to me that, that whenever we release, when we're broken, when we cry, when we see a barrier that we feel like we can't get over, that we turn toward God, and then God says, I'm going to fill you with stuff, son. Sis, I'm going to bless you. And he began to pour some things into David's life, and he began to recover. Verse 18 uses those two words. David recovered. Everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. How did it happen? How did he become such an overcomer? First, he got his passion back. Everybody say passion. passion. See, passion is not good or evil. It's according to which way you point it. It's that energy inside of you. It's that octane, amen, that, that you receive out of life. Amen. And that, it's, it's on his way back up. He began to get it back. Verse 6 says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. The NIV says, David found strength in the Lord his God. He prayed. In life, you can't get better. Amen. You've got to get better with that. Listen to this point right here. Dissatisfaction stops revelation. And without revelation or vision, there's no faith for the future. When you get dissatisfied, when you hit a place in your life saying, well, I, I, I'm, I'm just stuck here. I'll never be any better than what I am now. I'm 59 years old. And I ask myself, God, there's got to be better days for the church of God. There's got to be better days for the house of God. There's got to be better days for the people of God. Help me get to a place in life where I never get so dissatisfied that that's it. I, that, or, or how about this side? Get dissatisfied. I'll stay on this side of the barrier. Amen. I won't try to move any higher. There has to be something that moves on. I got to have revelation. I got to have vision. I got to believe for the future. So he got his passion. I love people with passion. Amen. I showed up at that car show Friday night. There was a car show over in uh, New Caney. And I drove in with my hot rod and my sister Lori. And I started walking around. And here people looked at me and said, hey, are y'all going to have that muscle car Sunday this year or not? I said, excuse me? They said, the car show. We want the car show. Oh, I said, it's going to happen September 27th. And the more I walked through, the more I realized this ain't a fluke. People were passionate about getting together at the little country church and having a car show again. And I thought to myself, God, this is, this is just an affirmation. I like being around people that are passionate to work, passionate to win people to Jesus. That's why I can't just sit in the house any longer. Amen. Our call is to reach people for Christ. Amen. There's an eternity at stake. I know there are people that could, you know, we got to say, well, we got, we got to board up. We got to, we got to quit doing this. We got, we got to stay six feet away. No, no, no. I'm telling you that eternity is still hinged right now on how we handle this thing. Yeah, I, I think you ought to be smart, but I still got to win people to Christ. I still got to pray for people. Amen. And that's what this whole week for me has been like. Second thing is he got a plan. Everybody say a plan. So he got a plan. David, verse, uh, verse 8, chapter 30 says, And David inquired of the Lord. He asked God, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. And listen to the question. The question was not is, do I have enough people? The question is, do I have enough strength? The question was not, do I have enough artillery? The question is, God, if I pursue, will I overtake? If I go after them, you're going to help me with this. Because the truth of the matter is, I can't do this on my own. I don't have the finances for it. I don't have the strength for it. But if you tell me I can do it, I can do it. So here he is. He wept himself sore. His men were turning against him. He's been displaced. But he has overcome so much in life. And I'm going to say to you, little country church, you've overcome so much in life. You've endured so many things in life. You've, I've, I've known many of your testimonies of what's happening in your life. You can't stop now. You can't let the next barrier stop you from keep pressing on. You've got to overcome that thing. Amen. You've got to keep moving. And he answered him, pursue, and thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, Ramirez, if you'd come on up, you will overcome. Amen. Pursue. Everybody say pursue. To hunt, to run after with a hostile. In other words, what I'm doing is going to be a little bit violent when I move after. To overtake, to reach, to overcome all. You've got to get a plan to overcome. It don't just happen. You don't just get healthy again. Amen. You don't just gain finances again. You, you don't just make friends again. you got to initiate it. I mean, people all the time say, well, you know what, Pastor? I just ain't got no friends. Why not? How hard is this? 
Well, that's a, more, a little more difficult today than it was seven months ago. But yeah, but still, how about that? How about that? Get, the, get the book of mom. Make friends. Make friends. Do something for someone. Quit expecting everything to come to you. Reach out. Lift up somebody. I want you to be an overcomer. There's no way that I brought in these young men and look at them and say, well, I, I, I want to always stay. I never want to stay on top of them. When God says fly, they fly. I just want to see them overcome. I want to see them blessed in their family. I want to see our whole staff that way. And I pick on Charlie quite a bit. I've known Charlie 20 years. But I've never seen Charlie more victorious than I have today. Amen. Overcoming, always encouraging and being encouraged. There's something about overcoming and lifting somebody else up and making them into that place. So David went after recovery. David recovered the prisoners. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 19. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons or daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. He got it all back. As a pastor now for 17 years this year at the little country church, I've been pastoring since 93. There are times I feel a sense of recovery. There's certain people that come back into my life. I feel like that's recovery. Amen. I'm reconnecting with them. It's, it seems to be always happening week after week. But there's nothing like getting your stuff back. Amen. To see it come back in your life. Third, David recovered the plunder. Your plunder is your, is your guns, your vehicles, your homes. What you once had. He took all the flocks and herds. And his men drove them ahead of the other livestock saying, This is David's plunder. Now I know we don't talk a lot about plunder. Many of you lost a lot in stock markets. You've got to start praying. God, I want to recover. Amen. I, I, want to do, I want to get a plan. I want to get some things back in my life. I don't want to go to heaven without you. I don't want to go to heaven without my children. You know, heaven's way too long of an eternity. It's eternity. You can't wrap your mind around eternity. You can't wrap your mind around 106 people leaving this planet every time I click my fingers. You can't wrap your head around that. But that's reality. David recovered his promise. The 400 men who were with David, his mighty men, they got mad. They became resentful. They were upset because when they took off after, 200 stayed back. In other words, not everybody believes in your plan of recovery. Not everybody into your passion. Not everybody's into you overcoming. So when I'm reading this, I read 600 men were there. 400 men and David pursued. 200 men sat back and said, you know what? We're not going to risk our lives. We're going to sit back here. And, and please don't be mad. We're going to wear our mask and stay six foot apart from everyone. Are you with me? I'm not being mean here. I'm just telling you something. So they stayed back. But 400 took off and pursued. They got their wives and sons. Not only they get their wives and sons, they got these 200 men's wives and sons and donkeys and dogs. And they got them all back. Came back to them. And when they got back to them, they got a little upset. Matter of fact, Scripture says when they got back, they were mad and they said, we're not going to share. We did the pursuing. We did the fighting. We ain't sharing. And David said this, all will share alike. In other words, when you win, I win. If I win, we're still brothers and sisters. So no matter how life goes, we're all going to be blessed here together. Can I get an amen? I love David's spirit because he understood overcome. He also understood there are times that these guys stayed back. I'm not mad at them. You know, as we built churches and people come into those churches that have been built, I don't get mad at them and say, where was you? We're digging them holes. Where was you when I was getting blisters? Where was you when we put this carpet down and painted these walls, built that room back in? But where was you? I don't say that. I say, welcome. We're glad you're here. You're in the right place. Amen. And for you to think this is the last time we're going to build, you've lost your mind. Because there's going to be plenty of work ahead. Can I get an amen? There's going to be opportunity for you too. Hallelujah. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Well, overcomers, overcome. I close with these words. Plan, 
pursue, overtake, recover, overcome. I've lived off this verse. It became so real to me during 9-11. It was a verse I used for the nation. I quoted it over America. I proclaimed it in the heavens. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. I will overcome. I will overtake. I will rescue. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. There will be times you'll feel like you're in darkness. There'll be times you feel like there's no hope. I want you to reach back to the Word of God. You realize that David had those places in his life. But every little thing you've overcome through life has prepared you for this place in life. You're going to overcome again. You are overcomers. Thank you, Jesus. Devil, my failure is not final. I'm going to bloom, float, walk on water, resurrect. My call is being confirmed. We will sit in high places. We will ride upon the waves. We will lead people in this house to Christ. We will destroy the enemy. We will rule and reign with our God. You have called us to be more than overcomers. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house. You have a weakness or a need in your body right now. You have a need for prayer, would you stand? You have a need for prayer right now, would you stand? We pray with you. Amen. Some of you may be standing for somebody. This week, I feel like I've prayed more for friends and family than I have in a long time. There's just something about prayer. Something about asking God. A few weeks ago, I said we have not because we, we didn't ask. We didn't ask. So we want to ask God for ourselves. We want to ask God for others. I'm smiling because I know that God's going to make all of us overcomers. He's got the best set up for us. He's setting you up. And you can't be an overcomer until you got something to come over. So you got to decide what is it i got to come over. Amen. I got to play a little football when I was a young man. They throw them blocking dummies out there. You hit that blocking dummy. You know, and it ain't hard to hit that blocking dummy at the beginning of practice. But you wait till your butt's dragging. And you wore out. You run up and down this hill enough times. So you're just tired. And all of a sudden they throw that blocking dummy out there and say, Now you got to hit that thing before you go in. And it's felt, you don't hit it, it felt like it hit you. And then after a couple of practices of hitting it, you know how to hit it. You know how to overcome it. And all of a sudden, it's not a, a barrier anymore to you. It's just a speed bump. It's just something you hit and move over. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up the hands that hang down. I speak strength to the feeble knees. God, I speak wisdom to minds that want to faint. God, I rebuke dementia, cancers, viruses, sicknesses, muscular, nerves, things that would try to impose the will against us to stop us from overcoming. I speak economy for the people in this house. God, you made us more than conquerors. You gave us the ability to prosper. Matter of fact, you say you rejoice when we prosper. So I ask you to be a prosperous people in this house. I thank you, God, that there'll be food to sustain us. The righteous will not go hungry. I thank you, God, we'll have enough to share with others. That we'll be able to bless our neighbors. We ask, God, that you help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. I ask, God, you bless these people. God, I pray an anointing rest upon them this week. As they go forth through life, that they would get a plan. They'd keep their passion. They would pursue and they would overcome in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like for you to reach and get you a tithe or offer an envelope there, which is next to you. You can be seated just for a brief minute. Amen. There will be a prayer meeting here on Tuesday night. 
We'll have communion on the 30th, which is next week. Amen. Then all of a sudden, things are going to start opening up. You can see the, uh, you can see the announcements as they pop up. But it's a couple I want to make is on September the 27th, we will have Muscle Car Sunday. The Tuesday and Wednesday before that, there will be a practice. We're going to practice, and you guys are welcome to come. It's not a, you know, it's just we're going to practice here in church. We've got, to, we've got to work through it. So we're looking forward to this. There's flyers in the back for you to pick up and give to people. You would, you'd be shocked how many people just really want to come to something like this. We're, we're moving the service up to 11 o'clock, and it's not going to be as long a service. We, we're conscientious about keeping people together maybe for too long. I, I told all the gearheads that are bringing their vehicles, we're going to be car hopping the food to them. In other words, Dennis, they, they stay at their car, and we're going to have the barbecue sack lunches, and we're going to run it out there to them so they ain't got to come in. And we're going to have different locations for the food. And, of course, we're going to need the tractors and the trailers to bring people in. Uh, there'll be some kids' activities. But just looking forward, just looking forward to that fellowship, that excitement, and to winning people to Christ. Amen. Giving people opportunity to serve God and love Him. Amen. That's what we're looking forward to. Then the week after that, we'll have our conference. 17 years as a church. Can you imagine that? 17 years we've been a church. Start, uh, so October, I think it's on the 4th, uh, whatever that, that first October is. And I, I decided, you know what? I think we ought to have Kenneth Smith to come back and preach for the conference. How about that? He was so excited. Amen. When I told him that, he's, he, I, I love that. Because, we, you know, we run with quite a few people that are maybe quote-unquote conference speakers but Kenneth has a heart for this church and a heart for God amen I think he's the guy with the word and even for the weeks I think Pastor Bob Utz y'all remember Bishop Bob the Builder yeah amen who means so much to us from California who should hopefully be here with us also so it should be and then I called this guy in Georgia and I said hello and he said Pastor Jerry is that you, Pastor Jerry? I said, how you doing, David Huff? He said, I'm 77 years old and I'm still rocking. <laughs> I said, you're going to be with us at our conference? He said, it wouldn't be conference without me. <laughs> so David Huff will be coming in here with his hot guitar. Amen. Of David and the Giants. And we're just going to have a great time. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a, just a good uh, week of fellowship. There will only be one added service that week. It will be that Sunday night. It will be in the New Caney campus. But we're going to feed you after each service. Val, we're going to eat here on Tuesday night. We're just going to have a good time together. Can I get an amen? Amen. God bless you. Everybody got your offering envelope? If you give it by phone. And by the time we hit Muscle Car Sunday, I'm going to give you a few announcements. We're redoing some things to make life easier on everybody. We're trying to get our ministries established and things like that. So we'll, we'll give you a, more of an announcement on that later as we move toward it. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I went ahead and ordered a hundred of them gators. You know what I'm talking about? Gators that slip over your face. I don't want to order a mask because them things ain't going to be no good here pretty soon. But us bikers and people that mow grass and pe hunters, they wear them gators, you know, to keep that face covered up. So I ordered us some holy wild gators for Muscle Car Sunday, you know. So you got to go somewhere you can advertise a little bit. Again, it's important that we continue to give. Uh, in a time like this, it's funny, like uh, we want to we wanna hold back naturally we want to and god said man if you could release it right now i can release it to you if you can sow a seed i can grow a tree you can take one seed and you can make millions of oranges but you could also lose millions of oranges if you never put that seed in the ground and i'm telling you if you continue to sow into this house it will be a blessing unto you and to your children and to their children. You never know. Like Pastor said, he said, some people are born into a blessing. That's not just because Daddy has a lot of money. Sometimes we're blessed because the Lord is blessing a line because of what our granddaddy did, because of what our grandma did. There's a lot of us in church today because grandma was praying, because mama was praying, amen? And so I just, I pray that you guys continue to catch a hold of the revelation that is giving, not just in, in your money, that's obviously important, 
but in your time, in your energy, in your prayers. Uh, our pastor always needs prayer. Continue to lift him up. The staff always needs your guys' prayers. Continue to lift us up. Uh, we want to continue to do what we do without fear. Without fear of government, without fear of of people saying this or that, but at the same time, we want to be able to love and to reach, and you can't do that without you guys. You guys are our hands and feet, so I'm just grateful for this house, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to get up out of here. Lord, I just thank you for the gift and the giver in this house. Lord, I just pray your word over these people. It says that if we give, it will be given back to us, pressed down, shaking together and overflowing. Lord, I'm just praying that this house wouldn't be a house of stingy people, but it would be a house of overflowing people because they recognize the power of giving, because they recognize the truth that is your word. And your word said it, so I believe it, so I do it. And I recognize I receive what it is you say I receive. And I'm grateful for this house, grateful for every man and woman in here. Bless them this week. And again, keep the virus from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today as we give, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to our kingdom. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Have a good one. Pick up your kids.